Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Philip Shane, Paul Boyer, and Brad. Coming up on DTNS, tech comes to board games, but there's still board games. Chris Mancini is here to explain. Plus, the first copyright test of text-to-image generators. And James Earl Jones hands over Darth Vader's voice to a computer. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, September 26th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. In lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Rapolino. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us, writer and podcaster, Chris Mancini. Welcome back. Uh, thanks for having me. Great to be back, as it, always. Lo- always a lot of tech to talk about. Always a lot of tech, yes. We keep thinking the show's going to be over, and then they just <laughs> they make more tech. Uh, in fact, let's start with a few tech things you should know. Netflix announced it established an internal game studio based in Helsinki, Finland. Now, you may say, hey, Netflix, they own some other game studios. They own three other game studios, but this will be the first building games from scratch. The studio will be led by Mark, uh, Marco Lastica, who previously worked at Zynga, developing Farmville 3, and before that, in EA's mobile division. Apple has confirmed it is assembling iPhone 14 models in India at a Foxconn facility near Chennai. It's expected to go on sale in India later this year. Uh, this is part of Apple diversifying where it assembles its phone. That's, Apple began assembling iPhones in India in 2017, but up until now, that was only older generations, so they're now doing the current generation in India as well. According to documents seen by Reuters, the Indian government proposed smartphone makers make hardware changes to support its regional navigation satellite system, otherwise known as NAVIC, in addition to GPS by the start of 2023. NAVIC became operational in 2018. Uptick has maybe not been where the Indian government wants it, and so they're thinking about um, putting in, man- mandating it in smartphones. Mm-hmm. Apple, Xiaomi, and Samsung reportedly sought until 2025 to support NAVIC, citing higher research and production costs. Got to build the, you know, the radios to support all that. The UK's Information Commissioner's Office has been busy lately, putting everybody on notice. And the latest to get a notice of intent is TikTok. Uh, The ICO said it has reached a provisional view. (laughs) I want to have more provisional views. I might think this. I'm not sure. Give me a moment. Anyway, provisional view uh, that TikTok's app breached UK data laws between May 2018 and July 2020. Uh, According to the notice, TikTok may have processed the data of children who were younger than 13 years old without parental consent. TikTok has 30 days to respond to that notice. And the New York Times sources say TikTok and the U.S. White House have drafted a preliminary agreement to resolve national security concerns. Uh, But we don't have any details on that deal. It isn't finalized yet. So we'll keep an eye out for that. Hasn't this been going on for literally years, TikTok harvesting information? Like, why Why are there still news stories? <laughs> like, people are surprised that this is happening. Well, that's why it's a provisional view. Yeah, because they're not surprised. <laughs> they're just, yeah. yeah. They're trying to decide to what emotion fits. Tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And the International Telecommunications Union is a 157-year-old organization originally formed to coordinate telegraphs across countries, a noble mission indeed. In 1949, it integrated into the United Nations system. It does not govern the Internet, despite headlines you may read. That's common misconception. But it does have 193 member countries and 900 participating organizations, so it can decide things that affect the Internet simply because of all the coteries have agreed to it. So... Who runs it has a lot of influence over the Internet, particularly over standards and interoperability. And this week in Romania, the ITU is choosing a new head to succeed China's Zhao Hu Lin, who has led the ITU for the past eight years. Down to two people, former U.S. Commerce Department telecom expert Doreen Bogdan Martin and forever Russian Deputy Minister of Telecommunications Rashid Ismailov. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh- It's not like, I mean, we've had China, a person from China in charge of it for the past eight eight years, and there's been pressure to do things, but it's not like one person just makes all the rules. But uh, which way they get pushed, uh, it makes a difference who's in charge. All right, let's talk about copyright. We're only just starting to get into the intellectual property implications of 
text to I- image generation, uh, open AI, all of the algorithmically generated content out there. But we do have a few precedents. We do have a few rules being made. Uh, for one, Dolly 2 and some of the other text image engines say that you can use generated images for commercial purposes. They, they just build that in. We're going to avoid that whole issue. If you use it from us, you can do whatever you want, sell it, whatever. That doesn't clear up all the potential issues, though. Uh, for instance, if my intellectual property is used in the data set to train the engine does that give me any say in what it outputs there's also lots of concerns about whether uh, the person who pressed the button really has the right to sell the image those are the kinds of things behind getty's recent ban on text to image generation from algorithms uh but we're getting another test a rich Yeah, so this kind of comes from the copyright perspective, and we have some precedent for how kind of the U.S. Copyright Office, at least, has dealt with AI. Uh, Back in 2019, they ruled that an AI engine cannot be the author of a copyrighted work, something tied to Stephen Thaler uh, with the work by the algorithm Creativity Machine. So he tried to say that Creativity Machine was the author of a work, and the ruling was upheld uh, earlier this year, so it it took a while for them to, to... Uh, you know, hit the appeals board and they maintain that copyrighted works have to include an element of human authorship. Not that they can't use AI tools, but an AI isn't a human. So you need human authorship to get, have a copyright in your name. In the United States. Now, Thaler has succeeded in in this in other places in the world, but just not in the United States. And we're talking about the United States because of what happened with Chris Kostanova. Uh, AI generated images can be used in a copyrighted work. That's what Rich was pointing out there. And New York-based artist Chris Kostanova received a U.S. copyright registration for the AI-generated graphic novel or algorithmically. When we say AI, it's useless, right? AI can mean anything. This is an algorithm. This was one of those text-to-image generator generated a graphic novel called Zarya of the Dawn. uh, And that copyright is effective as of September 15th. So it has been granted. It is in force. Kostanova used the Midjourney commercial image synthesis service for the work and was clear in registering the work that there was an assist from an algorithm. Kostanova wrote the story, created the layout, and shows how to piece the images together. So the human <laughs> did a lot of work, uh, but didn't alter the generated works in any other way. So the actual images you see came out of the computer. Kostanova's graphic novel is available for free. If you want to take a look at it, you can find it at aicomicbooks.com. Uh, this is definitely feeds into a, is it a tool? Is it okay to use the tool? Uh, a lot of people are saying that the main character in this book, Zarya of the Dawn, looks a lot like Zendaya. Are we going to hear Zendaya's uh, people uh, put a claim on this? Chris, you make graphic novels. You, you sell graphic novels. How does this make you feel? Well, I mean, the, this is an interesting thing because, first of all, how, what what do the robots feel about this? I mm, mean, the, mm-hmm. the, 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 what are they going to say? And uh, you know, once <laughs> they take over, they're going to remember this, okay? Uh, but what's interesting is when you make the graphic novels, obviously, to, uh, as a writer, he still wrote them, but it more affects the artists and the art, and I would probably uh, ask my artist uh, what he thought, but... It really is an interesting thing because it's like, well, if the art and the style is created by the artist or is it generated by the AI and it's uh, it goes so many things go into a graphic novel between the art and the layout and the the lettering and all of those things. It's a great question. Like what what is the the human contribution? What are the AI? I don't think we're completely there yet as far as like the AI making like a, a work of art completely as far as like a book or a graphic novel like you know a still image sure you know but uh this kind of happened before i don't know if you remember that game the last of us when it first came out uh there was uh, some controversy about whether or not that was ellen page's face for ellie and uh, mm-hmm. like there, there, that kind of uh, got, you know, a little bit of controversy there. So uh, especially when your AI main character looks like a famous actress, that might also be a problem. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, that's the first thing I saw, too. I, I I, Kostanova is obviously making a point here and very avowed, mm-hmm. avowedly has said, I want to test these waters. That's why I did this. I think in practice, mm-hmm. you would still have an artist to help with layout, to help with image selection, to refine individual images. 
uh, in order to to touch them up, make them look exactly the way you look, you want them to look. You probably also might want to modify them so they don't look so much like Zendaya, yes. so you don't so you don't get in <laughs> into that that situation because it's not just are you trying to use someone's likeness the way it was with Last of Us? This is also the idea that the algorithm was trained on images of Zendaya, most likely, uh, right? right? And so, mm-hmm. so there's that other side of the element as well. And, and one thing it could do is also speed up an artist's work. Like if the artist does the original drawings and style and compositions, and then the AI kind of goes in and like takes different angles or um positions of like the, what he, the uh, artist is drawing so uh in a way there's a real positive thing here if it could speed up because they <laughs> let me tell you graphic novels and comic books take forever to make and uh if there's like a computer way to speed it up without losing human element i think that could be very valuable well, speaking of human elements, as far as iconic performances go, it's hard to name something more distinctive than James Earl Jones's voice of Darth Vader, defining the character since 1977. But Jones is now 91 years old, so many have wondered how the character would be portrayed after Jones can no longer perform the voice. With the continuing Star Wars content plan since Disney bought the IP, seems like a pressing concern, at least for Disney, but, you know, Tom, it seems we, we we know what. Yes, we have an answer. Uh, Rather than task another actor with stepping into the role, it seems the plan will be to simulate it. Uh, With Jones' consent, uh, he has signed off on this. Disney has worked with a Ukrainian company uh, called Respeecher. They used archival recording uh, and and trained a proprietary algorithm to create new dialogue for Vader, focusing efforts to create Jones' voice as it sounded in 1977. My guess is they they feel like if they need Vader to sound older, they they can do that. But they 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 trained it mostly on his work from 1977. Now I um, yeah, I course. noticed this too. Oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, you're well. I, that that that's kind of the litmus test, right? Is like whether mm-hmm. people will notice this, and a lot of mm-hmm. people already have uh it was featured in uh the new uh obi-wan kenobi uh series uh some of the scenes with there with uh i guess spoiler darth vader uh was uh, uh featuring uh the work by reese beecher and uh, according to lucasfilm's matthew wood uh telling uh, vanity fair uh james did guide the algorithm's performance through many of these scenes so still has a hand in forming the character uh we've also heard the tech uh for young luke skywalker in the book of yes. boba fett so but chris i'm curious uh, mm-hmm. In terms of uh, hearing it and your reaction, like did it did it pass the uh, James Earl Jones uh, human test? You, you know, it's especially if you kind of know that it's not the actor, you kind of have that little subconscious uh, <laughs> bug in your mind. You're like, well, that's not really going to sound like it, and they do. They sound close, but they're still not the same as like hearing an actual human speak speak but uh you know when you you see how close people are getting like with the with Reese Beecher especially with like the Mark Hamill stuff and with James Earl Jones you know that we're getting closer to it actually being super close where it's almost indistinguishable but I'll give you a little bit of trivia about uh James Earl Jones's voiceover and what a a great guy he is uh like I would work with um audio designers and they would occasionally have Uh, James Earl Jones do voiceovers for like different spots and stuff and he would do them remotely and of course all the audio designers would be like oh well this is great can you record something for my voicemail or or whatever or something like (laughs) that because they would would always ask because like you know it's because they would want that uh, on their voicemails like you see how cool this is so what James Earl Jones would do is he would say all right this is what it would cost me to do it I'll do it for you for free but I want you to give that money to charity oh wow so that's what he would do for uh, all of those uh, audio requests for uh, voicemails. <laughs> I wonder if he is going to require Respeecher to do the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, did you, Chris, did you know it was Respeecher doing some of Vader's lines in Obi-Wan? I did not, but I'm curious if you knew that. I didn't, but I suspected because uh-huh. uh, I didn't know for sure because it, we had got, kind of gone through it with um, Mark Hamill. But uh, mm-hmm. it was like it was on that bubble of like, is it or isn't it? Well, and I think that's the key is when 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 you saw Luke Skywalker show up in The Mandalorian, you knew 
okay, this is either going to sound like old Mark Hamill or it's been <laughs> processed, right? And yes, when it didn't yeah. sound like mm-hmm. old Mark Hamill, you're like, oh, okay, they processed mm-hmm. it. So mm-hmm. that biases yeah. you. You're already thinking like, okay, yes. so this was synthesized. Does it really sound like mm-hmm. him or not? Whereas yeah. in Obi-Wan, I remember thinking like, wow, he sounds really good, like almost too good. Like, almost not the way I would think James Earl Jones today would sound, did they process it, but I also did not know. And so I think that's a truer test of how good it was when you aren't coming in with it going, well, I know they did something to it, and whether you well, notice or not. Here, here's the other big difference is, you know, um, Mark Hamill and Luke Skywalker is a natural voice, whereas whenever you hear Vader speak, right. it's through a rebreather. So mm-hmm. you already have kind of that layer of, like, distortion which can also hide any um, imperfections yeah. in the voice. So you've got an advantage there, too. Yeah, it, it, yeah I, I think it, where... Oh, go ahead, the, Rich. I, I think where, though, like, bo- in both of these instances, we're still dealing with... The actor is is still able to be involved in the, the creation of this character that they defined uh, in so many ways. But where I think... And, and that's why I think when when reading this, I don't get like, oh, like I, I don't get like a weird uncanny valley even feeling like that because I was like, OK, right. it's based on their voice. They're involved with it. I think where it gets interesting and where a lot of these companies they are dealing with these long tail IPs are going to get to at some point. Disney seems like maybe one of the first to get there is trying to keep, the, you know, these characters around and using these types of methods instead of doing recasting. And where it gets to, oh, now we're dealing with the estate of this actor, or and and the mm-hmm. not not definitely the legality of that is, I would think, fairly clear. Uh, I'm not a, a you know inheritance uh, uh, expert or anything like that, but <laughs> I, I think the perception of it is definitely different when we're we're talking about actors that can still be involved with it, and certainly both of these were by all accounts. Uh, versus, uh, you know, if if Grand Marf Tarkin's voice is uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know brought back. Mm-hmm. Uh, the same way as he was visually. I, or if there's a new Maltese Falcon movie, then you know, like, all right, that, I don't know if that's Humphrey Bogart. I think there's something <laughs> going on. Yeah. <laughs> you know, for a second, or I if, really uh, thought uh, Millennium uh, Falcon, even though you said Maltese Falcon, <laughs> uh, just because of the conversation. Uh, but yeah, I, I th- in, in, in the vein of all of that, I think it is important that this is the precedent of living actor says with my blessing with my guidance with you know my wishes i will hand it over to the computer uh it is more difficult when the actor is already gone but i i think this is a good precedent to follow to say let's not wait until they're gone and then have a big argument over whether this is okay you know let's let's line it up uh it may feel a little morbid to come to somebody like hey so when you die uh yeah. you know here's the thing but but you never know like, like even if people don't die their their voices could become you know changed by illness or or just not able to get up and get around and do stuff like that and it's it's important to have a succession plan so to speak yeah audio wise for sure yeah <laughs> All right, let's turn it over to Dan Campos in Mexico City with an update on some tech that's helping players at this year's World Cup. Aficionados que viven la intensidad del fútbol. This is NTX with some tech and sport news. The FIFA announced the release of FIFA Player, where the actual football players will be able to view data related to their performance during the matches taking place in the Qatar World Cup. The data will be synchronized with videos taken during the games in order to have the most efficient evaluation at key moments. The information collected won't be available to the public, but to the players themselves, their clubs, and some selected third parties. Currently, all professional soccer leagues monitor their players using the EPTS, the Electronic Performance Security System, which uses wearables to collect information and was introduced in 2017. For more information about this, check NTX latest episode. Back to you, amigos. Thank you very much, Dan. This is the, the what's cool about this is like for years, uh, all the sports games have just been chasing this realism, and this almost feels like the the continued video gamification of actual like it's the opposite now, and yeah. that to me is the most fascinating thing about all that. It's so cool. Pretty soon they'll be able to simulate the voices of the uh, soccer players you know, <laughs> as they pretend they're injured. Mm. Uh, <laughs> folks, if you have a thought about something on the show, but you don't know our email address, let me fix that. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. 
Recently on an episode of Star Trek Lower Decks, the main characters, who, if you don't know, live centuries in the future, uh, were playing a board game that included holographic elements along with good old-fashioned game pieces and dice and, and a board. Now, that may sound silly to you, and Lower Decks is an animated comedic take on Star Trek, so maybe it was, but it's not far off to some of the things we're seeing now. Chris, what kind of tech are we seeing in board games? You know, it's pretty uh, amazing. Like, I, board games have seen a resurgence over the last couple of years, and there's, like, different levels of tech as it goes into board games, and there's always, like, kind of, like, the purists were like, I don't want any tech in my board game, but... There are certain ways where it's like super beneficial. Like when you have a super complicated game like uh, Gloomhaven, which we play a lot, but it takes a very long time to set up, play, and uh, tear down, even for like one adventure. Um, you can have what are called helper apps. Hmm. And the app will kind of keep track of like monsters' hit points and uh, uh, the scenario that you're on and the rewards and all of and the player conditions and all of those things. So it kind of helps you keep track of everything. Um, the other thing it will also do is kind of like hide information to make it a little more dynamic. Like mm. where if you're looking at the the scenario board, it has everything that you're, you're going to see in the adventure, but the actual app can kind of hide those things. And then the next level up, which is also really fun, is like a game like Mansions of Madness or Return to Dark Tower, where the app is integrated actually into the gameplay, where you can't play it without the app. So th the way you can look at it is like when we used to play Dungeons and Dragons, but there was always a DM, a dungeon master. Well, that dungeon master is taken over by the technology, so everyone could kind of play together, and nobody has to actually um, be the dungeon master, which is really fun, especially in co-op games. Uh, like Return to Dark Tower... You have a giant tower in the middle of the game, which is fun, but the app does all the heavy lifting. It tells you where to put the monsters and when the tower is going to spin and uh, what the victory conditions are and gives you quests. So uh, it's integrated into the actual uh, gameplay. So I, I really like that approach because it kind of it simplifies things. And I know purists don't like it, but I do because it uh, it kind of takes that away from like, all right, like, well, where's the monster go? Now I have to have a player that actually, you know, has to worry about the enemies. But there's something on the horizon that I have only seen in videos, but it's super expensive, but it's like kind of like the next level of board gaming, and it's called uh, uh, AR gaming. And there's a company called Tilt 5 that is actually uh, creating holographic board games. So what happens is you actually have a board and then you all wear AR glasses and the, the games come alive right actually in front of you. Now, it'll be a mix of classic games or uh, new games. But what's interesting about it is where's the line then where it's just a video game or it's a board game? Like what tactile, you know, uh, things that you can have, like you can move pieces around and roll dice or is everything just going to be like a wand and glasses and then which case okay well then it's then it's a video game so it's an interesting dynamic for sure and i'm very anxious to see where it's going yeah i i, I think uh one of the things that stoic squirrel brought up in our chat room now is that the the tech can be controversial uh, if it's required to play. Now, Dark Tower, the original, had technology in it, so it, it's kind of just carrying on the legacy there, and it comes with the game. But with the apps, is there con do you run into controversy where people are saying, no, 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 I don't want to use apps because I don't want to have to use the app myself, and, and if some people are using apps, then maybe that's, that's going to give them an advantage, et cetera, et cetera? Well, somebody's always angry about something on Reddit, so sure. sure. Yeah, there's always somebody. But my gaming group, we're a little older, so we're uh, open to different ways of playing. And I, I like playing it both ways. Like, I like the, you know, the super low tech of a board game where you're turning over cards and moving pieces. But I also like the AI assist and the AI that's basically controlling the game where you're playing against the, uh, the game in, in an app. Uh, so, but, and like I said, the AR, the Tilt 5 stuff, I haven't seen yet. I've only seen it in videos and it looks amazing. I'm just not sure, like, you can't really tell, like, where, what the experience is unless you yeah. actually do it. So I'm very curious to see. The problem is it's very expensive. So it's a bit of a buy-in to, uh, to try it out. Well, and to your point about, you know, kind of this line of video game versus board game. I mean, I remember... 
I mean, even back in the PS3 days, there was uh, that PlayStation Eye camera and they had that game Eye of Judgment, which was kind of the other side of this, which was, hey, we have this incredible graphics processing software. Let's point a camera at a bunch of, you know, it was more of like a Magic the Gathering kind of card game, uh, like card combat game. But that idea mm -hmm. of, hey, we can we can add this element to it wasn't incredibly successful because I'm sure people are Googling it right now. But like <laughs> that idea always fascinated me that like we can have that. And if you can not require the set console and with a wired camera and all that stuff. And it's, mm -hmm. you know, if, if when AR glasses become more of a consumer good, right. I can I can see that becoming uh, super exciting. And, and I really think at the end of the day, the technology is going to be used as tools and it's going to be really about the designers and the artists on how yeah. they use it, where I, I feel like there's going to be an AR board game that's super boring and like a video game, or there's going to be one that's absolutely brilliant, where it's going to be like the system seller where you can't Play, there's like no experience like it so i think it's really gonna be up to the creativity of the designers and that's one of the things that happened with dark tower i really felt like they mixed like uh the technology and the gameplay of like the old school 80s uh dark tower like like super well like it's not too complicated it's not gloomhaven but it's complicated enough that it's fun to play and it's just you know it, it's just fun to have a tower in the middle of the uh board that's bluetooth connected to your uh your tablet spitting skulls out at you yeah so. <laughs> yeah what's not to love right yeah <laughs> good clean fun uh, well, until five, if, if people are curious, uh, if, you only have to have five dollars to reserve it. But the actual price will be three hundred fifty nine dollars for one set of glasses. And you'll be very right. lonely if you only have one set. <laughs> so you're talking three fifty nine dollars for every person you want to play with. Right. Right. Mm hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, that's enough of living in a fantasy world on a tabletop. Let's move to a world where we smash things into asteroids. Ah, uh, yes, our glorious present, because let's face it, if you're an enthusiast for either dinosaurs or disaster cinema from 1998, you know that a massive asteroid hitting the Earth is an existential concern. Now, to be clear, there's no threat right now or indication that any asteroids are coming toward the Earth. Calm down. <laughs> don't, don't worry. Don't panic. Everything's fine. But NASA's Double Asteroid Redirection Test, or DART, is being billed as a, planet a planetary defense test mission. This will send a spacecraft traveling over 14,000 miles an hour to crash into the Dimorphos asteroid in an effort to alter its speed and orbit. Dimorphos is about the size of the Great Pyramid of Giza, so a nice, uh, nice size asteroid, all things considered. In case you're worried, this should not knock the asteroid off its trajectory. It wouldn't hit the Earth, nothing like that. Dimorphos is a small asteroid orbiting a larger asteroid called D uh, Didy Didymos. The impact should shorten its orbit around Didymos by about 10 minutes, a measurable amount, just enough for us to check that all our calculations are fine. No need to worry. Everything is fine. Go about your daily lives. The DART spacecraft will send back imagery and data up until the moment of impact, and its companion craft, the Italian Likia Cub, will also monitor the crash. The collision is expected at 7.14 p.m. Eastern Time on Monday the 26th. It takes about 38 seconds for light to travel uh, from Dimorphos to Earth, so there will be a slight delay. Now, I know a lot of you will be listening to this after the impact, and so we're so sorry we got it so wrong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I uh, feel yeah. like I mean, like you look at the timing of this is like, well, why now exactly <laughs> are we doing these these tests? And you could tell like the best way to tell if it's a real serious threat or not is book a tour at JPL. And when you're on the tour, see how quickly people are moving back and forth. Mm -hmm. And then you'll know yeah. what's, uh, what's going on. Or if on. your tour just gets canceled. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, let's check out the mailbag. We got a great one from Marty, uh, who wrote, just finished the episode, you were talking about NVIDIA's announcement and their use of the USD format for the metaverse. Wanted to say, I work in live events and production, and the USD format has been gaining traction over the last year in our industry for media server, projections, XR, etc. Work for the reasons you described. We were just talking a few weeks ago about adding support for it into one of our products, and it looks like it's going to be the new standard moving forward forward. So we'll see where it goes. But wanted to mention it's already being used and growing in applications outside of the metaverse too. Uh, that's great, Marty. Thank, it's good to hear from somebody inside the industry saying, yes, the standard NVIDIA picked has got some momentum elsewhere as well. Yeah, definitely uh, uh, good to hear uh, from the real, real world. Uh, and then uh, uh, Thor sent us a message uh, in Patreon. He said, just finished listening to GDI 4361. And since you were discussing the future 
director of podcasting and the benefits of short form content, I wanted to share my experience from the Fountain and Podverse podcast apps. Both apps support clips. Users uh, made clips that let you get a taste of a highlight from a longer podcast. On Fountain, users can also like a clip by sending a small amount of Bitcoin, otherwise known as Satoshis. The app is also trying to incentivize listening and clip creation by awarding currency when listening. Love to hear your thoughts about this and kind of uh, uh, the podcasting 2.0 spec, uh, if you check that out. Uh, and there's some other cool apps that allow you to uh, stream uh, currency to the podcast while you listen automatically. Other cool features. Uh, but the interest keeping things short. I'll leave the rest for you to explore. Yeah, thank you, Thor. Uh, appreciate you sending these along. We'll have links to both of those, the Podiverse and and Fountain, uh, in in the show notes. I, I see a lot of these kinds of efforts. They're very interesting to look at, uh, and so I always watch to see like are are they getting critical mass? Are they getting people to sign up? And and so I'll, I'll keep an eye on these as well. Yeah, definitely. Well, let's uh, say a big thanks to Chris Mancini for being with us. Uh, Chris, you've always got some cool stuff going on. What's going on with you these days? Absolutely. I've been uh, working on the new company, White Cat Entertainment. We're kind of like a boutique publisher of like books, graphic novels, and uh, podcasts. And the two podcasts, of course, one of them you've been on, What Are You Watching? We kind of go through like, like people in entertainment who make entertainment and see kind of what they're watching, movies and TV. But the uh, other one that I've been really uh, happy with and been growing is The Journeys of Professor Atwood, which is a podcast to kind of help people tone down anxiety, help with insomnia and help them sleep. And it's a narrative podcast where... Uh, you don't have to do anything. It's just I wanted to make something that could actually just help people where you listen to these stories about a professor who goes on these journeys and then has a bed of sound effects and music that kind of like is uh, almost like technologically specific to help you relax and uh, go to sleep. So it's kind of a very, very calculated, funny, weird narrative journey that can kind of help you relax. And who couldn't use a little bit hmm. more relaxation right now? So so that you, they're all free. You can subscribe to uh, uh, White Cat Entertainment. Yeah, as you watch the asteroid get uh, smashed into. Perfect yes. follow-up. <laughs> That aren't coming near us at all. Don't worry. But if you need to relax, we now know. Yeah. Uh, uh, get some good news. Uh, well, it's Monday, so we always want to thank our new boss. And we have a new boss, Chad, who just started backing us on, on Patreon. Chad. Thank you. Chad. Chad's the best. You could be tomorrow's Chad. Patreon.com slash DTNS. Uh, patrons, stick around. I can't imagine we're not going to talk a little more about Vader and comic books and all that kind of stuff. Good Day Internet has all that. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC at DailyTechNewsShow.com slash live. Back tomorrow talking Raptor Lake with Patrick Norton. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>